Hello, everyone, and welcome tonight. It is Sunday night, March 24th, 2024, and my name is Glenn Rawson. Welcome to this devotional. Tonight, I'm going to share six stories, and uh, the reason for these stories is remember. It's all about remember. There are a number of significant anniversaries coming up uh, starting a couple of days ago and going forward for the next week, and I would like you to remember some of those stories from historical events of the past. So again, thank you for joining me tonight. Now, an announcement before I begin. June 3rd, Dennis Lyman and I are taking a group of people and going across the Pioneer Trail. There will be an eastbound group, and there will be a westbound group. And we will stop at all the sites along that trail. Now, I've talked about this before. If you're interested in the tour, go to historyofthesaints.org, and all the information is right there. But if you have pioneer ancestors who came across that trail between 1847 and 1869, I promise this will be a significant experience to go out and see the sites as they saw them and learn what that trail was really like. I'm inviting you to come and to join us. Also, and again, in July, this coming July, a unique tour. I've never done it. I don't know anyone else that's ever done it. Is the Old West and Cowboy Tour. We'll be leaving out of Salt Lake. It'll be a bus tour for about eight to 10 days, and it'll go across the the significant sites of the Old West, the settlement of the West, Jackson Hole, Yellowstone, other places like that, where we're going to talk about how the West was won. It'll be a fun tour, so I hope you can come. If you want, again, more information, go to historyofthesaints.org and travel with me. I'd love to have you. Now, just, an also, just a note also of thank you. There's been a significant push to increase our weekly subscribers. Now, those are these are those people who have chosen to receive every Sunday a story from me for free. It's a, it's a video copy of the story as well as a printed copy of the story. And I know that a significant number of you collect those stories. So if you'd like to receive these weekly free emails, just go to the website, glenrossonstories.com, and sign up, and we will share these inspirational stories with you. It'll come right to you every Sunday morning, and you're welcome to use them however you will. But to all those of you that are weekly subscribers now, thank you. And if you feel inclined to share it with somebody, thank you for that as well. And also, to all those that are VIPs, now these are the people that pay a little fee every year for some extra privileges that come uh, through the work that we do, free book and other things. All those of you that are VIPs, thank you for that support. And thank you uh, for the constant um, love and kindness that I feel coming from you and the prayers. Thank you so much. And speaking of prayers, Please have a prayer in your heart tonight for what I want to share with you. Again, these stories are in remembrance. Okay, this first one. In the summer of 1832, Joseph Smith the prophet, with the assistance of his friend Frederick G. Williams, began writing down for the first time the History of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And as far as we know, it would be the first time in that history that Joseph ever wrote down what would later come to be called his first vision. So, now, in the ensuing years, he would dictate that a number of times. He would write it down himself four times, or he would dictate it for others to write it down four times. But there are about eight to 10 different accounts of the first vision out there. And uh, no two of them worded exactly the same. So what I would like to share with you now is 
the very first account that he ever gave of the first vision. And quickly you will come to see this account is what that vision meant to him personally. He recorded the following in that 1832 history. At about the age of 12 years, my mind became seriously impressed with regard to the all-important concerns for the welfare of my immortal soul, which led me to searching the scriptures. My mind became so exceedingly distressed, for I became convicted of my sins, and by searching the scriptures, I found that mankind did not come unto the Lord but that they had apostatized from the true and living faith, and there was no society or denomination that built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament. And I felt to mourn for my own sins and for the sins of the world. He continued, I cried unto the Lord for mercy for there was none else to whom I could go and to obtain mercy. And the Lord heard my cry in the wilderness. And while in the attitude of calling upon the Lord, a pillar of, a pillar of fire, light, above the brightness of the sun at noonday, came down from above and rested upon me, and I was filled with the Spirit of God, and the Lord opened the heavens upon me. And I saw the Lord, and he spake unto me, saying, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Go thy way, walk in my statutes, and keep my commandments. Behold, I am the Lord of glory, who was crucified for the world, that all those who believe on my name may have eternal life. Behold, the world lieth in sin at this time, and none doeth good. No, not one. They have turned aside from the gospel and keep not my commandments. They draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And mine anger is kindling against the inhabitants of the earth to visit them according to their ungodliness and to bring to pass that which hath been spoken by the mouths of the prophets and apostles. Behold and lo, I come quickly, as it is written of me in the cloud of glory, in the glory of my Father. Joseph then said, My soul was filled with love, and for many days I could rejoice with great joy, and the Lord was with me, but could find none that would believe the heavenly vision, end of quote. Now, whatever else it means, this account of the first vision reveals that it was a very personal conversion experience for Joseph. He sought diligently the forgiveness of his sins, and imagine his joy when that blessing was received. Now, considering that Joseph would later prove himself by nature to be very careful in speaking of sacred things. It's a wonder that he shared this at all. And could it be possible that he only shared here one perspective on a rich multifaceted theophany? And that he shared only as much as we needed to know. Could the prophet Joseph have said more than all the other combined accounts have shared? Of course he could. But he never, never shared everything he saw and all that he heard that we have record of. Now, please understand, I have laid personally all the different accounts of the first vision side by side and studied them. They do not contradict. But instead, these different accounts weave together like the multicolored strands of a tapestry to tell a beautiful story, only a portion of which we are allowed to know, and only as much as each account shares. Now, I think you'll understand 
ultimately when it comes down to it. It's not what Joseph left behind in the written word by which we know the veracity of his first vision. If we want to know if Joseph Smith spoke the truth, don't get bogged down in the differing accounts of the first vision. Go to God. Have faith in the Almighty and ask him if God actually appeared to the boy Joseph. It is absolutely vital to know that answer. I share that because Joseph said sometime early in the spring of 1820, he saw the father and the son. Now, we don't know, and there are those who think they do, but it's based on pretty flimsy evidence. We don't know exactly when Joseph saw the father and the son. But suffice it to say, sometime early in the spring, and spring has started, so I share this with you as a remembrance that as spring dawns upon this part of the world, it brings the remembrance that God and Christ brought new life to planet Earth, starting with a sacred grove in New York in the spring of 1820. Next story. Approximately, what would it be? About 180 some years ago today in the evening. Sometime in the wee hours of the morning of March 24th, 1832, an infuriated mob exploded through the door of the summer kitchen of the John Johnson home in Hiram, Ohio. Once they burst in, they pounced on 26-year-old Joseph Smith Jr. and began dragging him out the door. Now, it all happened so fast, Joseph was on the stoop of the house before he actually came awake, struggling. He freed one leg and kicked one of the mobbers in the face, sending the man sprawling out the door. That man jumped back to his feet and with, all, with his hands all covered with his own blood, he grabbed Joseph by the throat and choked him until he lost consciousness. When Joseph revived, he saw his old friend and counselor, Sidney Rigdon, stretched out and unmoving on the cold ground. Supposing that Sidney was dead, Joseph asked the mob for mercy. They cursed and swore, call on your God for help, they said. We'll show you no mercy. Men seemed to come from everywhere and join in the fray. What would the mob do? Would they kill him or would they just rough him up? The decision was made to hurt him. And to that end, they proceeded with purpose. Tearing off all his clothes, all but the shirt collar, they beat, kicked, and scratched him. One man fell on Joseph like a mad cat and scratched, lacerated his body with his nails, crying as he did. That's the way the Holy Ghost falls on folks. Someone brought forward a bucket of tar, which they then smeared over Joseph's lacerated body. At the same time, trying to force the tar paddle into his mouth. He resisted, clenched his teeth. They kept trying. And then they tried to force a vial of nitric acid into his throat, aqua fortis. Again, he clenched his jaw and fought back and fought back. In so doing, they broke the vial and spilled the acid over his face, which significantly burned him. Had they been able to pour that down his throat, they probably would have burned his throat and ruined it. More than likely, they would have killed him. In the, in the, in the scuffle, as it was, they burned him with the acid and broke one of his front teeth. Now, how bad was the attack? 
How bad was the beating, the brutality? They tore out a patch of his hair by the roots. It never grew back. They injured his side in such a way that it pained him the rest of his life. And they killed him. Joseph would later describe an out-of-body experience, standing above his own body and watching as the mob beat him and poured the acid over his face and neck. Then a noise was heard and the mob fled in cowardly fear, leaving Joseph partially conscious on the ground. When he came to, he tried to sit up. He couldn't. Unable to breathe, he pulled the tar from his mouth. And after a short time, he made his way toward his home. Emma stood in the doorway, saw him coming, and fainted at the sight of him, thinking he was all covered in blood. Once inside the house, he stood by the fire, and his friends and family spent the rest of the night peeling and scraping the tar from his body, sometimes taking off layers of skin with it. All of that for the faith. Now, it made a lasting impression on the mobbers and members alike when the next morning, Sunday morning, the Sabbath, Joseph stood and preached a sermon meekly, following which he baptized three people. About a week later, after this brutal beating, Joseph according to Revelation, set out for an extended visit to Missouri. He would not quit. He would not give up. The work was true. Why did that mob assemble all those years ago today? Well, what were they angry about? It would seem that Joseph had received a new revelation. And in that revelation given to Joseph and to Sidney, they had turned the Christian dogma upside down, that it wasn't just heaven or hell in the next life, that there were three degrees of glory. And after receiving that revelation, Joseph had told the brethren, don't share it. The world is not ready for this. It is trusted to you. But instead, some of the brethren went out, spread it through the community, and it angered the locals. They considered him a blasphemer, an antichrist, and light and truth stirs up darkness, and the darkness attacked and nearly took the life of the prophet permanently. My dear friends, Darkness is always angered by light and truth. It has been that way. It will always be that way. And I would expect that you and I should not expect anything different right up to the very end. Endure to the end. Moreover, I suppose from this experience, you and I should draw a conclusion. And that is, when you stay on the covenant path and do all you can to be good, and do good, you can expect that the adversary and his minions are going to take every chance to beat you, to injure you, to maim you, to destroy you, your reputation, and your family. It has always been that way. It will still be that way. God bless you. Keep going. Now, this isn't a story. A few minutes ago, I talked about the first vision. And I suppose, to my way of thinking, it's no surprise when the enemies of the church attack this vision. They they get all bent out of shape because there are multiple accounts, as I mentioned. They claim that Joseph Smith just made it up, and then embellished it as time went on. Uh, That it has become a, a focal point, as it were, of attacks on Joseph. That's no accident. 
Because you see, if we can destroy the first vision, then the entirety of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints goes down with it. Consider these statements from the Lord's living prophets. Gordon B. Hinckley. This glorious vision of God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ in broad daylight in the spring of 1820 is the greatest event that has transpired in the world since the resurrection of our Lord. End of quote. Again, from President Hinckley. Great was the prophet Joseph Smith's vision. It encompasses all the peoples of mankind, wherever they live, and all generations who have walked the earth and passed on. End of quote. The first vision affects God's children on both sides of the veil, he's saying. And consider this one. In 2003, President Hinckley said, if the first vision is true, this is the most important thing on earth. If it isn't true, all the work of this church is a falsehood. We stand before the world and bear testimony and witness that it is true, that after centuries of time, God, our eternal Father, actually appeared to a young man and spoke to him and introduced his beloved son to him, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. End of quote. Again, speaking from Rochester, New York, near the Sacred Grove, President Hinckley said, this is where the first vision occurred. This, meaning the first vision, this is the pivotal thing of our story. Every claim we make concerning divine authority, every truth we offer concerning the validity of this work, all find their roots in the first vision of the boy prophet. It becomes the hinge pin on which this whole cause turns. If the first vision is, was true, if it actually happened, then the Book of Mormon is true. We have the priesthood. Then we have the church organization and all of the other keys and blessings of authority, which we say we have. He said, now it is just that simple. Everything turns on the reality of the first vision. End of quote. That's powerful. In 2004, President Hinckley said again, the second cornerstone of our faith, the second cornerstone of our faith is the first vision of the prophet Joseph Smith. Think about that. This transcendent experience opened the marvelous work of restoration. It lifted the curtain on the long promised dispensation of the fullness of times. Without it as a foundation stone for our faith and organization, we have nothing. With it, he said, we have everything. End of quote. You start to see the picture? President Howard W. Hunter said it this way, I am grateful for my membership in the church. My, di my testimony of its divinity, let me repeat that. President Hunter said, my testimony of this church's divinity, quote, hinges upon the simple story of the lad under the trees kneeling and receiving heavenly visitors. If it is not true, Mormonism falls. If it is true, and I bear witness that it is, it is one of the greatest events in all history. End of quote. Again, from President Hunter, Joseph Smith's greatness consists in one thing, the truthfulness of his declaration that he saw the Father and the Son, and that he responded to the reality of that divine revelation. He was directed to reestablish the true and living church restored in these modern times as it existed in the day of the Savior's own mortal ministry. 
the prophet Joseph Smith was fearless in pursuing this divine mission, end of quote. From President Ezra Taft Benson, again, the first vision of the prophet Joseph Smith is bedrock theology to the church. You should always bear testimony to the truth of the first vision. If we do not accept this truth, if we have not received a witness about this great revelation, we cannot inspire faith in those we lead. End of quote. From President Spetzer W. Kimball, nothing short of this total vision to Joseph could have served the purpose to clear away the mists of the centuries. Of all the great events of the century, none compared to the first vision of Joseph Smith. End of quote. And if those are not bold enough, try this on from President Heber J. Heber J. Grant. Quote, any man who does not believe in Joseph Smith as a prophet of the true and living God has no right to be in this church. That revelation to Joseph Smith is the foundation stone. If Joseph Smith did not have that interview with God and Jesus Christ, the whole Mormon fabric is a failure and a fraud. It is not worth anything on earth. But, he said, God did come. God did introduce his son. God did inspire that man to organize the church of Jesus Christ. And all the opposition of the world is not able to withstand the truth. It is flourishing. It is growing. And it will grow more. End of quote. Again, from President Grant, the most glorious thing that has ever happened in the history of the world since the Savior himself lived on earth is that God himself saw fit to visit the earth with his beloved only begotten son, our Redeemer and Savior, and to appear to the boy Joseph. It is the most wonderful, marvelous thing that ever happened. From President Joseph F. Smith, the greatest event that has ever occurred in the world since the resurrection of the Son of God from the tomb and his ascension on high was the coming of the Father and the Son to the boy Joseph Smith. To prepare the way for the laying of the foundation of this kingdom, not the kingdom of man, never more to cease nor to be overturned. End of quote. I share that with you, my dear friends, as an anniversary celebration. Sometime in the ensuing days, Joseph, we celebrate that Joseph saw the father and the son early in the spring of 1820. I want you to know, I know that he did, that his account is true. And I also want you to know and understand, notwithstanding those who say differently, that the words of the prophets are true. If you know this event for yourself, blessed are you. You can lead, teach, inspire. You can grow the kingdom. If you do not know if Joseph Smith really did indeed see God and Christ, find out. Find out. Let's take a break. Hang on a second. I want to see if I have a copy of it here. Yep, I do. Right here. See this book? I worked a long time on this book, and I want to recommend it to you. It's not a commentary on the New Testament. 
It's not that. And it's, it's also not fiction. It's absolutely true. What this is, and, and I take full responsibility for the book, is a collection of 30 years worth of work. From the time I first became a seminary teacher way back when, I loved teaching the four gospels. And I loved those stories of the Savior. I've spent hundreds and hundreds of hours pouring over the Lord's, the stories about the Savior and the stories of his parables, trying to understand. I, I, I don't know why, but for some reason, it's always been my thing that, yeah, the words are just black ink on a white page, but they convey human emotion. This book walks through the life of the Savior, examining each of those stories about him and sh sharing the insights and, and the things that I've learned over a long period of time. Now, it's not the end all. This book is just a contribution that will help you understand the Lord and his mission better. It will give you insights into the Lord's thinking, why he did what he did, why he said what he said. It will show you the perspective from those that he healed and helped. My intent, my hope through this book is that you will love the Lord Jesus Christ more. That you'll ask questions for yourself like I have in here, and you'll get to know him better and his work. This book is available at glenrossonstories.com. If you'd like a copy, they're still there. Also, I wanted to let you know that General Conference Weekend, now for those of you that live here in Utah, I can say this, if you're outside of it, I'll make sure that a copy is made available on Facebook and YouTube, but General Conference Weekend, Saturday morning at 9.30, just before conference starts, Dennis Lyman and I, a History of the Saints, are going to share a general conference special, Pioneer, the Pioneer Trail. Now, every general conference except one since we first started with History of the Saints, we've been invited to share a segment of history as part of the general conference weekend. I would be honored if you would take the time to watch Saturday morning, 9.30, just before conference on KSL Television in Salt Lake City. I don't know if it'll be broadcast. I think it will be broadcast across the web page. But either way, I'll make it available to all of you in the outside, outside of Utah once it's over. But again, the Pioneer Trail revisited. Another anniversary this week. Remember that line? From the revelations, my son, all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. Or again, many are called, but few are chosen. And why are they not chosen? Remember those? Just four days ago, in the year 1839, March 20th, 1839, in the dank, cold dungeon cell of Liberty Jail in Clay County, Missouri, Joseph Smith and four others of his companions were imprisoned, and that by the duplicity of traitors, they had been arrested, and on the strength of false testimony by false friends, they had been bound over, awaiting trial in the close quarters of that filthy, dark dungeon. They had been there since December 1st, 1838, nearly four lonely awful, cold, suffering months they had spent in that dungeon, enduring privation, humiliation within those forbidding stone walls. Now, that was the period of time, and that's where Joseph was. Now, consider further Joseph and his fellow prisoners were judicial hostages. 
They weren't there because they had really done something wrong. They were being held in bonds in jail to ensure that the Mormons got out of the state. Agonizingly helpless, Joseph and his friends languished on that rough stone floor as their friends, their families, were mobbed and driven from the state right during this period of time. Oh God, where art thou? Joseph dictated on this date. And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? How long shall thy hand be stayed, and thine eye, yea, thy pure eye, behold from the eternal heavens the wrongs of thy people and of thy servants, and thine ear be penetrated with their cries? That was a part of that monumental treasure of a letter that Joseph dictated beginning on March 20th through March 25th, 1839. Twenty-nine pages Joseph poured out his soul in that letter that has no equal in church history. From that letter would come not only a revealing view into the noble soul of Joseph Smith, but three revelations of the Doctrine and Covenants, sections 121, 122, and 123. That letter, on many levels, is a documentary treasure. Now, at the very end of that letter, perhaps even on this date, Joseph himself penned a note to his wife, Emma, whom he had not seen since January. Among other things, Joseph said to Emma, quote, Never give up on an old tried friend who was waded through all manner of toil for your sake and throw him away because fools may tell you he has some faults. End of quote. Think about what he just said to his wife. Don't throw me away, Emma, just because people are bad-mouthing me, trashing me, spreading rumors about me. Joseph was a sensitive man. He cared what people thought of him. Where were his friends at this gloomy hour in his dungeon? Well, some of them had turned against him, branded him a criminal, and considered him of no worth, and then went through the countryside telling everyone how awful he was. What about Emma? Did Emma still believe in him? Two weeks later, from up north near Gallatin, Missouri, April 4th, 1839, Joseph wrote another short letter to Emma, and after pouring out his affections for her and the children, he wrote again, quote, I feel like Joseph in Egypt. Doth my friends yet live? If they live, do they remember me? Have they regard for me? If so, Let me know it in time of trouble. Dear Emma, do you think that my being cast into prison by the mob renders me less worthy of your friendship? No, I do not think so. End of quote. But did Emma think so? Joseph didn't know. Moroni had once told Joseph that his name would be had for good and evil, and of the many things of his ministry most difficult, those friends who turned against him, that cut deep. Late April, 1839, Joseph was a free man. He struggled in his gaunt condition to leave Missouri and reach his beloved Emma. Perhaps as he walked across the Missouri prairie, he wondered, will she welcome me? Part 2. Dimmick Huntington lounged about the Quincy, Illinois boat landing, looking, waiting, any information from Missouri. Just then he saw a disheveled stranger leaning against a fence rail, 
His ragged pants were tucked into old boots full of holes. Dimmick approached him, looked up into his face. My God, Brother Joseph, is that you? He cried. Recognizing his old friend, Joseph insisted that he be taken immediately to his family, to Emma and the children. Dimmick located a second horse, and together Dimmick and Joseph rode the three miles out east of Quincy to where Emma was staying. As they approached the house, Dimmick described that he reined in his horse, held back, while Joseph approached the house, the gate, and dismounted. As Joseph stepped off the horse and turned towards the house, the front door suddenly burst open, and Emma ran out and threw herself into Joseph's arms before he was even halfway to the gate. His questions were answered. Welcome home, Joseph. I love this story because it speaks of love and loyalty. When Joseph thought everyone had turned against him, Emma was still there. Next story, again, an anniversary. In two days, someday in the future, when we are beyond this life and can look back into mortality from the vantage point of eternity, when we're able to see the history of this world as God sees it, there will be certain events and dates of greater significance than this world ever knew and understood. They will be those moments like the birth of Christ, the resurrection of Christ that passed largely unnoticed that will have done the most good for the most people for the longest time. Now, among those monumental gold leaf dates, one of them will surely be March 26th, 1830, two days from now. What happened on that date? Do you know? It signaled the beginning of the, quote, marvelous work and a wonder that would sweep the entire earth and affect every nation, every people, indeed, every family on both sides of the veil. God himself marked that moment as a sign to all the world that a great work would commence among all people where he would gather out from all the nations of the earth the scattered and lost members of the house of Israel and restore them to their respective lands of inheritance. And it started on that date. That moment was also a stern warning. March 26, 1830, a stern warning to all the world, quote, when you shall see these sayings come forth among you, then you need not any longer spurn at the doings of the Lord, for the sword of his justice is in his right hand. And behold, at that day, if ye will spurn at his doings, he will cause that it shall soon overtake you. Third Nephi 29.4 <laughs> What was that event? that God marked as a sign of great change coming. What happened on March 26th, 1830? Answer. It was on that date in a small two-story brick building in Palmyra, New York, that the Book of Mormon first went on sale. The Book of Mormon, a marvelous work and a wonder, a witness and a warning. Last story. This story is one of those found in this book. And it's fitting 
approximately, approximately 2,000 years ago this week, the Savior returned to Jerusalem to die. It was on this date, one week before Easter Sunday, on a Sunday, that Jesus left Bethany, rode on a donkey up over the Mount of Olives and down into Jerusalem. And as he did so, the people, the common people, came pouring out, celebrating what they could clearly see and recognize as the fulfillment of ancient prophecy that the king of Israel was coming into Jerusalem. And they lined the streets, throwing out branches and palm leaves. All the city was moved in the celebration of the moment that their king had returned. That was again approximately 2,000 years ago today. I want to share a story that took place roughly 36 hours before this event. On the Friday before, now the, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem was on a Sunday. On the Friday before, Jesus with his disciples came to Bethany. And there, as he had done before, he was hosted for supper by Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now, this is our third encounter with these three, and Lazarus had been raised from the dead just a short time before. Again, as before, Martha served the meal. Suddenly, Mary came to the table. Follow, please. Mary came to the table carrying an alabaster box of ointment which she then broke open and anointed the Savior's head and feet, head and feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the sweet-smelling spikenard lotion. This lotion was by any standard a very expensive and extravagant offering, and because of that, some of the disciples began to murmur with indignation at Mary's presumptuousness. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Judas complained. A pence was a day's labor for a working man. That lotion was worth almost a year's wages. In saying that, can you imagine how those unkind and callous words would have stung Mary's tender soul. Her offering of love was criticized and rebuffed. Jesus came immediately to her defense, and with some indignation of his own, Jesus said, Let her alone. Why troubled ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. Verily she has come beforehand to anoint my body to the burying, he said. And then he added these solemn words. She has done what she could. And this which she has done unto me shall be had in remembrance in generations to come, wheresoever my gospel shall be preached. End of quote. Hear that. What an awesome promise for such a simple act. It was as though Jesus was saying, I want this woman to be remembered and this moment remembered for all time by every disciple who ever follows me at any point in the future. Why? What was it in that simple act by Mary that was so important to him? First, as I mentioned, that was no ordinary offering. That was not your ordinary Walmart lotion. It was spikenard from India. And as I said, worth almost a year's wages for a working man. It was an uncommonly expensive sacrificial offering. Next, 
to anoint one's head and feet, as she did him that night at dinner, was an act of reverential homage rarely rendered even to kings. Further, Mary had saved this ointment, Jesus said, for his burial. Think about that. Where so many of the Savior's disciples did not believe or accept his ominous predictions of his own death and rising, Mary believed him. She believed him when they didn't. Sacrifice, love, faith, and lastly, kindness. Even and perhaps especially, the perfect Son of God was so affected by Mary's timely love and kindness that he memorialized her for all time. Consider where Jesus was at this critical moment. He was preparing to die. He was preparing to suffer beyond all description and die. It would have been a terrible, lonely human burden. But Mary was with him. Her heart was knit with his. And in heart and mind, she was his friend and told him so. And it meant so much to him. I've thought a lot about this story and hours of prayer. And I know this to be true. Please remember that every measure of cruelty and unkindness we give to others, every measure of cruelty and unkindness we give to others will be remembered and return to us when the Lord comes again. If we do not repent, we will have to face and then feel all the hurt we have brought on others. But those who practice the art of godly kindness and empathy will bask in the warmth of the Savior's loving kindness on that day. To say it another way from another time, to be kind to others is to be kind to him. Jesus is the Christ, and he is coming. And how we live and how we treat others, yes. It matters. Good night and God bless.